start here. Thanks everybody for attending. Gonna talk to you about this. And I am also going to set a watch so that I can see what time it is for myself. Great. All right, so a bit about me. I've spent the past decade creating all sorts of different visualizations. And you can see a bunch of the work that I've done. It's also, but they've also been covered by uh, various media outlets. This link is to this uh, video that I put together also for this conference. Uh, feel free to check that out later. Some of the work that we've done has gone viral, hit number of million views. Um, some have been kind of heavily kind of shared or tweeted, retweeted, liked. Uh, doesn't seem like very much, but this is under the context of Edmonton. And some of the posts that we put up on Reddit have front page a number of times, actually. So here's a few examples of things that we've done. And so I want to share with you my visualization formula. Again, trademarked according to me. So go figure. So in terms of that, um, we have attention spans that I want to talk to you about. I was talking to someone recently saying, taking a look at an article and saying, oh, you know, this is somewhat interesting to me and I'm willing to spend more time than general. I think it, typically when we look at articles online, we spend a lot less time, three minutes. And really I would make the case that uh, we spend even less time just trying to decide whether we care. And three seconds to me is actually long. I suspect that a lot of people have even smaller attention spans than that. And the way to try and get people to um, increase their attention spend is just relevance. If you have a data set or something that your boss needs that you need to make a decision on, it's relevant to you, you're willing to spend the time to pay, pay more attention. It's not the only thing, though. The other thing that helps to increase attention spans for people, I think, is whether or not the data or the visualization is engaging. And so if it is, then you'd spend more time. To give you an example, this is a visualization of Facebook posts and the number of users that shared across it. Uh, to give you some context, this is actually from Facebook shares of posts by a, an insurance company. Don't care anything about that, but man, does that visualization look interesting. And so I think that's a good example of how an engaging visualization can help. On the flip side, because we know that people have smaller attention spans, you have clarity as a means to try and make it easier for people to consume the data or the visualization that you're, you're, that you're trying to show. I like this example. It's a straightforward line chart. It's not visually engaging, but it's really straightforward to see, okay, this is really just about showing the contrast of weekly ICU admissions in 2021 2020 to 2021. Um, what's not shown here in part because this was uh, part of the video is just that these are previous years flu ICU admissions. So uh, it gives you a bit of a comparison, but again, it's not really about the engaging part. So to me, like there is this hurdle of attention and you have these three elements. And yes, Natalie, I agree with you. That piece right there was a work of art, like amazing. Anyhow, sorry. Uh, right. And when you, you have these three elements, and the question is, does it pass? So for me, something like this, it's clear. So the clarity is high. It's relevant to me to some degree. It's not super engaging. That's great. It passes the attention span kind of like a mark that you need to, the bar that you need to cross for something like this, which is a piece of art. It's visually engaging. I don't, it's not relevant to me at all. I don't care. But man, I look at this and I think, oh, this is really, really cool. So this is another visualization. Look, it's the most innovative car makers for communication systems. It's an index score with asterisks on top. It's so visually engaging. So it passes the test, right? It's so awesome. Amazing stuff. Except doesn't feel right. And I think it's because there's this bit of a second hurdle, which is the need of the output to be something that is entertaining or insightful. With this visualization, even though immediately it's visually engaging, it's not really providing me any real insights. It's not really entertaining. It's not great. 
So to me, the formula is this. You have those three elements on the left. You need to pass a certain bar uh, for attention, depending on how relevant it is for someone. They have to understand it and then turn it into insights and entertainment. And if you don't have those outputs, it doesn't really matter what the first part is either. So I'd focus a little bit more on clarity. Think of your data as just raw material that you can mine to get the diamonds and of insight. Unfortunately, it's bells and whistles that we tend to put on visualizations because we want them to be engaging. But on the flip side, I think it's common for people not to understand. I know I did this a lot earlier in my career. They're not really actually helpful. They're contributing towards noise. So some things to increase clarity, you can remove distractions like backgrounds, patterns and textures, fancy effects. Images and icons can also be distracting. Bright and varying colors can make it difficult to look at visualizations. The way to think about it is a data ink ratio. You want your ink data ink ratio, sorry, you want your data ink to be high. You don't want noise, sorry. You want there to be less, not as, not a lot of unnecessary ink, sorry. So for example, we have this bar chart here. Seems pretty straightforward, but there's a lot of color and whatnot. And I'm not going to go through this in much detail, but I want to quickly forward this so you can kind of see the patterns of what's going on. If you're curious, on our website, we have a number of these. We call them Data Looks Better, Better Naked series. Yeah, so you start from this and you go to this. This makes it so much more succinct and clear for people to look at. Another example is with spreadsheets, where you have your typical Excel kind of um, look initially. And if you're trying to show this to other people, you want to reduce all the different unnecessary noise. Um, this part, by the way, my colleague didn't like, uh, doesn't like Calibri. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, you add the emphasis for the part of the story that you want to talk about. So you go from here to here. You want to know your, your audience, understand their purpose, understand what's relevant to, uh, if it's relevant to them. Uh, if your audience is someone in the public realm and you want to get them to be interested in data, this is great. I mean, like this is visually engaging. But if your audience, if, if for them, you want them to really understand and be able to compare this data, a bar chart isn't as visually engaging, but it's more clear. This is an article about and a visualization about uh, women CEO in Fortune 500 companies. It's gone up to 4%, and it's great. It looks great according to this visualization, but really the fact that you probably wanted to highlight is because it's the glass ceiling persists, is how small that 4% is, even though it's growing over time. So this is that same chart on the right that you would have seen on the left here. Note on pie charts, people like it because it's more visually engaging because it's color and people like round things. Um, part of the problem is pie charts often have problems with it. If I'm going to ask you to compare in this case, how large the slices are in relative it with one another. It can't, but with a bar chart, it's a lot simpler to get there. This is a wonderful chart, piece of art uh, in a different way. But yeah, this is talking about, uh, I think, wood, wood sales. And that same chart, that same pie chart in a bar chart looks a lot, makes a lot more sense. In this case, there is an attempt at comparing social media referral traffic from B2B to B2C. So you've got these donut charts, and they would have much better been much better communicated with this instead. Good example of pie charts are ones that have one or two things, really one thing you want to highlight. I really like this one too, in that it shows how small that proportion of national endowments for the arts, humanities, and for public broadcasting is relative to the entire budget. 
Uh, another one that's good, even though there are multiple things, the title of the story, the colors highlight this one part, which is about red meat. And so it's clear, distinct. Uh, the next one is my personal favorite of a pie chart. Uh, I just stopped it there for you all to enjoy this piece of art because I, I think this is amazing to me. I think it's important if you can to be a storyteller and allow for a simple flow so that your audience can go through and understand what it is that you're trying to show to them. I want to show you this one, a bit of a biased example because I made this, um, but you may not be super interested in baby names, but I think stuff like this is super engaging where use of Arya as a name shows some annotations for uh, Game of Thrones. I, I think it's, yeah, basically showing the names. If you're familiar with Peyton Manning, there's that. Will and Grace. And then Liam Neeson. Oh, Liam's like one of the top names, one of the names I consider for our son as well. Uh, but yeah, it's a really popular name at this point. And then not every name is there. You can pick a name. But anyhow, the whole point here is that it's pretty visually engaging and that the visualization just drives you forward to be looking through the data. Um, I mentioned virality at the beginning of the talk. Um, so then the question is, what is the most important thing? And you'd probably think, and I would agree to some degree, that engage, something that is engaging helps with virality. Uh, here's an example of a visualization for the growth in the city of Edmonton, basically. And this is done by showing when cities were built over time. You can see this suburbanization happening across in Alberta or in Edmonton. And it's a problem that Edmonton has more than, say, Vancouver, because there's only so much land in Vancouver. They use the law, right? And so um, it's visually engaging as a story. And I think that's what happened. So engaging is high. The engaging part is high. It's not immediately clear. I think it takes people a few loops to go through it. But you got me engaged, so I'm willing to spend the time to look into it a little bit more. And then, you know, it's entertaining. It has some insights. And so I'm willing to share with people. So engagement, uh, something that's visually engaging, is a requirement for uh, virality. And then I probably show you, like, that's not always the case. So for those, I think probably everyone here understands, uh, the, has heard of the stereotype of Karens. I am sorry if your name is a Karen in this part of the presentation. Um, I know a few Karens who are not at all. What do you think of a stereotypical uh, Karens? But yeah, someone put together this. And it this is from Reddit, and it's 123,000 upvotes. Now, might not really think of it, but 123,000 in Reddit is huge. Like, it basically, you'd have to imagine that at least a million or a lot more people actually uh, went through and saw this. But is it visually engaging? I'd make the argument it isn't. It's very clear, but it's also entertaining for the memes, right? And I don't know if the insightfulness is really there either, but you get the idea. Uh, as another example, 90% of Reddit are users who are lurkers who don't post or comment. It's a little bit more engaging, but it's not the engagement part that gets people there. It's that it's clear and it's also somewhat relevant to obviously the Reddit crowd. So clarity is king. It's the most important thing. Not quite either. I mean, at the end of the day, I was talking about that bar that people have to cross. And in this case, this is also very, went pretty viral here. Uh, yeah, someone decided to uh, put record their kids saying, and like, I think it's engaging. It's not as clear, right? Like, but it's not the point. It's the story here with the data that you're looking at. And, you know, I have a kid and who loves Minecraft, so I can relate to this. Um, yeah, it's really cool to me. Um, and I think that's why it got so, uh, so viral. So again, the engaging part is a little bit higher it's entertaining. And there's some insights there. So targeting the general public is something I want to briefly mention. 
Um, in particular, just the attention part. I don't actually have a visual to follow this, but I think the insight here is important. Over time, especially with New York Times, and I've seen other publications do this, they have decided not to do interactive visualizations. And the reason why that's the case is they've noticed that people don't like to click. It's effort to try and dig in to understand the insight that you're trying to show. So wherever possible, especially with the general public, you want it to be really straightforward and easy for them to get there. So I think that's a major part of that. Uh, yeah. And so I'm going to ask at this point for any questions that people have. It can be about this. It can be about visualization. So whatever you want to ask, please go ahead to do so. I'm not done yet. Uh, I've got like two more slides. But I've noticed that through the different sessions, at, the questions are left till the very end. And people don't get a chance to just type out what it is they have questions about. And if you want me to show something else on the previous slides, let me know as well. About clarity, if you're super interested in like this clarity part of it, please check this out. Uh, these two books are really useful. They show you how to reduce your presentation to something that is, or your data to something that is interesting or clear, sorry. Here's my visualization formula. Uh, if it's wrong, I apologize, <laughs> but yeah, I, I think so far it's done me well. I've, I've put some thought into how this all works and how I consume and judge visualizations and how when I look at the properties of how different visualizations have gone viral, even if it's not ones that I've created, it works within this foundation. Two final things. If you look into the expo part, there is a top three visualizations that blew my mind and will inspire you. Um, I hope, thanks for Paul who mentioned uh, that this was being, this presentation is engaging. I think that's engaging. I must have spent maybe like hundreds of hours doing the research that try and nail down the very most interesting different visualizations that I've seen over the past long time. So uh, please give that a check. It's under the Expos part. And the final thing that I'm going to ask for everybody before I get to the questions is if you, the one thing that I am really interested in is if you have feedback about this presentation or about that one, because it takes me a lot of time to put these together and try and get them to be interesting to people. And uh, that one in particular, I haven't done before, but I think it's really interesting. And I don't know if I should share it to other conferences and other people, whether or not uh, if it's like, let's say, different uh, within the government sense, different government teams might be interested in this sort of material. So I greatly appreciate any feedback. And then I'm going to get to the questions. I'm going to leave that there. OK, so Karen, your question. My organization has worked to make interactive visualizations. Are we on the wrong track? No, you're not. Sorry, let me be clear about that. I think it depends on the audience that you're trying to get to. I want to show you one example, and it's a bit of a, another biased example. But uh, we create at Dark Horse a lot of interactive visualizations. It's, I, I think, closer to our bread and butter, actually. So I don't think it's necessarily wrong. It's a question of who your audience is. So in this case, there's. This is tracking like 30 million Americans, 20 million Americans across 30 years. And in this scenario, you want your planners and analysts who are the users to be able to dig in and get into really, really intricate data at a very granular scale. And so the audience in that case needs to have the ability to go in and actually look at the data, play around with it. And it's important to get there. That said, uh, I know that in this particular visualization, Opportunity Insights, which is a group that uh, got us to build this for them, really wanted more of the general public to also have an understanding of what happened. So if you were someone from Seattle, they produced, or uh, there's this part here where there's a visual storytelling, but the school telling that lets people go through and just look at the insights of this community. I'm not going to go through the story, but... Uh, it makes it a lot more consumable for someone who doesn't know the tools, right? So you can link directly to the story itself and people can still understand what happens. I, okay, sorry. Uh, Andrew, is open data the main source of data used for your visualizations? Uh, actually, it depends on the work that we do. 
But for me, a lot of the personal side projects that end up being a company project start off with just open data. Just so much that I use from open data, it's crazy. And this is why I really appreciate the open data community. Without the community and you all pushing for this sort of access, I wouldn't have the data to be able to create the things that make it useful or accessible to people. And I understand there is that gap between data and information. Um, but if the data is not there, I can't do anything, right? And so some of my most interesting visualizations, and I'll just, again, I'm sorry if this ends up feeling like I am just like showing you stuff that I've built. I don't mean for it to be. I just want to show you like examples that I think you know are interesting. So in this case, this data, Edmonton was one of like three cities in the world that I could find. And I spent, I don't know, at least 20 hours, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it's like multiple days of like searching hard to find data about that has building footprints and property data information. So this is about property assessments. It goes down to a very granular point in that there's like 300,000 buildings that are being visualized all at once, but most cities don't have that data. And without this, I wouldn't be able to show the different insights and be able to visualize things in a really interesting way. So I think it's cool. I, I do wanna show you this one example that I think is really awesome in terms of this visualization in particular. So the anything that is like, yellow to red is higher assessment value. Anything that is blue is lower. But you can see within the city of Edmonton, uh, these houses around ponds makes perfect sense. They tend to be of a higher property assessed value and they would have been sold or bought at a more expensive price. Um, so I think it's visually interesting to see the contrast. There's other examples and other stories in different cities. Uh, but one thing that I find personally kind of cool is like you get to click on this and you see that the property assessment for, for this is like 1 million. But then if I like go across the street and I keep going blue, like right across the street from this guy is from the million dollar assessed home is something that's 450,000. So yeah, I think it's 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 super cool for you guys to keep opening data, especially things that are more granular. It's awesome. Um, sorry, depending on audience, when you say the evidence of insights sometimes have to be visible or read. It doesn't, doesn't. So sorry, the full question is depending on the insights, wouldn't you say that the evidence of insights sometimes have to be visible right away to get people's attention? I don't necessarily think that's needed. If you're able to make something that's visually engaging, like with the example of um, shoot, this one right here, sorry, a lot of slides here. Unless there's like a hundred slides. If okay, like this one right here, not necessary in this case. Uh, of course, then you kind of have to up the ante and. A example and a good one, I think, is if you go on Reddit and look at the r slash data is beautiful, a lot of the viral visualizations are simple. They call them racing bar charts. So you can see movements over time, right? So basically, it's like, uh, I don't know, number of game sales for video games or something over time. The insights aren't there right away, but you can see that the bar charts are slowly moving and then moving on top of one another. And so I think it's super awesome. And like, basically you don't get the insights right away, but you're that engaging part makes you think, okay, maybe I can investigate more into it. Uh, Alex, Alexis, what tools would you recommend for interactive visualizations and maps? Uh, there's lots out there. I would suggest looking at Tableau or uh, for some of you, Power BI as a way to just get started with um, a lot, figuring out the interactiveness of visualizations with maps. There's, I think ArcGIS has something, I don't remember the name of that tool right now, but it, there's lots of tools out there. They do hit some limit, at least to me, and that's why we build the visualizations that we do. And that interactivity needs to flow a little bit quicker, I think, with especially something like Tableau, but that's nature of those tools. And I'm not trying to say it's bad. Like I use Tableau myself all the time and of the top 30 visualizations, one of them specifically actually uses Tableau as well. So I, I'm, I think that's cool. Okay, uh, sorry, I'm going through questions and oh, maybe this is my, my uh, no more questions here. I've been aggregating, it'd be great to have interactive graph of case states. Oh, speaking of that, uh, again, 
don't mean huh, I, I gotta show you guys this because I think this is super awesome. Uh Tableau public. So I've taught a few courses uh, just to people who are interested in uh, data visualization. And come on, uh, give me a second here. But an interactive COVID interactive visualization actually isn't that crazy to do. In fact, one of the courses that I, I've like put together is this, where I have people download the data from the uh, from the government of Alberta, and I kid you not, it's not a lie. In ten minutes, we go from taking that data and then putting this together. So this is an interactive visualization of COVID data. And that's why I wanted to do that as like a simple course to people who are interested in visualization to show them that they can take data that is open and available and just like, well, I can now filter for Edmonton, right? Now this data is old because I downloaded it at a point. It's possible to probably connect this to an API, but I'm honestly kind of not super trusting of APIs because like half the time things change and people who put all that time to creating the visualizations are no longer able to access them. And thanks, sorry, uh, links to the books at the end of the chat. I can, sorry, and also, oh, there you go, Esri. That's right, thanks, Paul. Um, DHA.io slash top 30 is, so this is the link to the video itself, but to the links of the books, I will, uh, once this time has gone off, I just want to answer whatever the last couple of questions here. Um, what about radar charts? They are the most common taken. Yeah, you, radar charts are super interesting too. Oh man, like I, I wish I had the example there, uh, but my colleague actually did this awesome thing where radar charts are also unfortunately extremely, they can be extremely, uh, what do you call that? Um, misleading. But it's not to say that you don't do it because sometimes clarity is important, but I, I'm trying to show too, right, that there is that bar. And ideally, you have visualizations that are both clear, but also um, they're also engaging. So just to show you this, uh, what was this thing? This is water data AFIN alberta.ca. And the reason I'm just bringing this up is this is an example of a radar chart that uh, we've done, like this one right here. I think one of the main problems with radar charts is the area. Often radar charts tends to be, um, I'll skip the tutorial here and I'll zoom this in. Right, so this is a radar chart. And so it's not to say that radar charts are bad and you should never do it. I think it depends on what you're trying to achieve. So you can kind of tell from here. I think the, the major problems with examples of radar charts are the ones that are like just the area covers and it makes it makes things look bigger than they should. So in this case, this arrow actually helps with that. Okay, so I think technically the time is done. Um, Frederick, I am going to find the links to the books and put it at the end of this chat. Again, please check out both the present the uh, top 30 presentations. And I really appreciate any feedback that you have, feel free to give it here or just uh, on my, just directly through me. My email address is here. And thanks everybody for attending. Everyone, I'll stick around and try and like type this in. If you have any questions, feel free to just ask here. I know that the session technically is ending. I don't want to stop everybody else from going off to the other things. And I know I screwed up because there's a Q&A. Oh, yeah, never mind. I think that's already answered. Thanks, everyone.